Good afternoon, everybody. This is David Heyer. I'm with the Department of Employment and Economic Development for the state of Minnesota, DEED, as other people have known it. Uh, I also run the Foreign Trade Zone for uh, the Commission, and uh, today we're doing a Foreign Trade Zone uh, webinar. And to introduce everybody and to uh, do welcome, I uh, will hand it off to Kevin McKinnon, the Deputy Direct Deputy Commissioner of Economic Development for the state of Minnesota. Kevin. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks, Dave. Uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with you, uh, but also the time that you're taking to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, foreign trade zones. Uh, as uh, Dave mentioned, uh, the Economic Development uh, Deputy Commissioner here of DEED, and uh, my history with the foreign trade zones goes back uh, actually up to 2001. Uh, I was uh, a sort of part-time administrator for the program in Colorado Springs back in 01, moved to Minnesota in 2006, uh, and immediately uh, became involved with and uh, working with uh, the foreign trade zones here uh, in Minnesota. Uh, I truly believe the integration of uh, our programs and um, al aligning those with other programs that a lot of people don't even understand uh, and uh, bring that uh, sense of um, uh, availability to people is an important component for uh, our department, uh, which is why uh, in uh, 2014, uh, we offered uh, to uh, be the administrator of uh, the foreign trade zone in the uh, metropolitan area uh, and have run that program, uh, administered that program for the last uh, eight or nine years uh, here out of deed. Uh, so again, um, uh, for us, uh, certainly at the department, appreciate Dave's uh, obviously involvement, but it it comes along with a whole suite of other programs that we can offer uh, businesses. And uh, this program, not as mainstream, uh, obviously, as others, uh, we wanted to make it easier for uh, people to obviously understand uh, the program, but then also to increase the usage of that program. Both things uh, we have accomplished over the years. Uh, and uh, and really proud of it. Uh, so again, uh, today uh, I'm uh, grateful for all of you taking some time to learn more, uh, but also uh, to our consultants who are with us here uh, today, uh, who, uh, in fact, I recall uh, Marshall Miller and, and Miller and Associates back from uh, my days in Colorado Springs, uh, that play a key role uh, in helping educate and work with companies uh, in uh, administering these, this program. So uh, glad you're all here. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to be part of this, Dave. Uh, and uh, I'll turn it now over to, uh, I guess, Brian and uh, Marshall here to uh, take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yep, good. So nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Brian Brown. I'm with a law firm called Miller and Company. Uh, we support uh, David Heyer and his efforts uh, in their role as the grantee of Foreign Trade Zone 119. He asked us uh, to make a presentation uh, along with some of the economic development people uh, in the region to explain to you uh, some of the benefits a Foreign Trade Zone can offer your business. Uh, we've titled the presentation uh, foreign trade zones, possibly the best tax incentive you've never heard of. Uh, and that's because this is a program for importers, and it's a way to either um, defer payment of duties, uh, reduce uh, duty payments, uh, or eliminate them. Duties are uh, obviously a tax. Uh, they just have a different name, but they're a tax on imported products at the border. So uh, we've got about 10 or 11 slides. Uh, Shayla is collecting questions in the chat, uh, and then we will um, uh, present those questions and answer them towards the end of the presentation. <clears throat> uh, as always, uh, we want to take a moment to thank today's sponsors. David uh, was more involved with this. Uh, David, do you want to take just a second to address the sponsors, and then I will uh, move into the substance of the presentation. 
Sure, the uh, foreign trade zone uh, would like to thank the sponsors, um, Anoka County, Carver County, Dakota County, Hennepin County, Ramsey County, Scott County, and Washington County. They're either regional economic development organizations or community development organizations sponsored this event today, and we'd like to thank them for offering that sponsorship and bringing this to everybody's attention. Thank you very much. Okay, Shayla, shall we begin with the first slide? So, um, the slides today are presented with a question on the left and some bullet point answers on the right. These slides will be available for you afterwards. Um, we presented this sort of in the format uh, that business people would want to know. Uh, what does it do? Uh, what are the benefits for me? Um, is it popular? Um, uh, what does it cost me to do it? What's involved? Um, so, uh, what is a foreign trade zone? Uh, and who can benefit from using one. So the foreign trade zones were actually created, created by a Foreign Trade Zones Act of 1934 during uh, the New Deal era. And they were created to quote unquote, expedite and encourage foreign commerce. The effect of the act has been to really increase exports, US manufacturing and US employment. And we'll see in a minute some of the, the statistics on those. Uh, foreign Trade Zone 119, uh, that David uh, administers uh, was created in 1985. So an FTZ is essentially a designated area, either a building, a plot of land, or some combination thereof that allows a company to import merchandise. This is an importer focused program under special customs rules that offer the company a range of unique benefits. So if you uh, apply and become authorized to operate a foreign trade zone, you have access to a special set of customs regulations that will give you unique benefits. Most companies with import operations can benefit from using FTZ procedures, but as always, uh, there's a question of scale and a cost benefit analysis involved. So Shayla, we have, so, so now we're gonna take a minute and talk about some of the benefits. The primary benefits you're going to see are going to be uh, duty savings, savings on, on duties. But there are several other uh, uh, benefits that also provide savings to the bottom line. So uh, duty deferral has to do with postponing payment of duties. And merchandise that is admitted into a foreign trade zone, and the, the verb is to admit, you import merchandise and then you admit it into a foreign trade zone, is not subject to the payment of customs duties until you remove that merchandise from the FTZ and enter it into US commerce. So um, as long as it sits in the zone, there's no payment of duties. Uh, if you have a large amount of imports that are subject to duties, you avoid paying those duties while they sit in the zone. And in fact, if you end up exporting uh, those that merchandise to Canada or Mexico, for example, duties are never paid. And, uh, under other commercial scenarios, you'll have a choice of, of a lower duty. Merchandise admitted into an FTZ and used to produce a different product is subject to the lesser of the duty rates on the finished product or the originally imported component. So how does that work? So let's say, let's take my glasses, uh, these um, glasses that I buy for six for $12 on Amazon, my reading glasses. Let's say I'm an importer of these glasses. I buy them from uh, Singapore and I import them in the United States. They have a zero duty. So if I'm a, a, a foreign competitor of a glass manufacturer, I can import these glasses in the United States and pay zero duty on them. But let's say I'm an assembler of these glasses uh, located in Minnesota, and I import these lenses from Brazil and pay a 5% duty on them and import the frames uh, from Vietnam and pay a 10% duty. I have a 5 and 10% duty built into my cost structure uh, when I bring them in the United States. And I'm at a disadvantage against my I'm at a disadvantage against my foreign competitors uh, because they don't have that cost structure. But if I bring these materials into a foreign trade zone, get author authorization to produce them, uh, put the lenses and the frames together, and then enter them into the U US commerce, I now have the option to pay the zero duty rate on the finished glasses. And that's really at the heart uh, of, of what foreign trade zones offer to manufacturers is they offer you the choice to basically eliminate the duty on your components. And the way the harmonized tariff schedule is set up in America, generally there's going to be a zero duty on finished products, sometimes lower duty, and a higher 
duty on imported components. Now there's one exception, there's always exceptions. Exceptions tend to make up the rule. And if you're importing products that are sec subject to section 301 duties on, uh, on China goods or section 232 duties on aluminum or steel or anti-dumping or countervailing duties, then uh, the duties on those components are generally going to uh, remain on those components uh, even after you manufacture them. So if my lenses had a 5% duty uh, and my frames were from China, then I would be able to avoid the 5% duty on the lenses, but not on the frames from China, okay? So a couple of the other uh, duty savings is duty avoidance. Uh, merchandise admitted into a foreign trade zone and later exported either in its original form or as a component of a finished product is not subject to the payment of U.S. duties. Remember, you import, uh, you import the finished glasses, you admit them into the foreign trade zone. Let's imagine these glasses have a 5% duty. If you end up exporting them, they've never been entered into U.S. commerce uh, and you never pay the duty. And there are lots of companies who have, who stage their distribution operations in the U.S. for distribution into the Caribbean, for distribution into the Caribbean, uh, Canada, Mexico, uh, and other places. My apologies for, for my phone ring uh, during the presentation. Now there is um, one exception, uh, as always there are exceptions. If you're manufacturing products uh, that you're then shipping, exporting to Canada or Mexico, the USMCA requires you to pay uh, the US duties on the imported parts. There's a special program uh, called duty deferral, but at the end of the day, you're going to be exposed to the duties on the U.S. components. And then lastly, there's another option for duty reduction or avoidance, and this is often overlooked by companies. Companies uh, will have scrap, waste, they'll have obsolete or surplus goods that end up never being sold uh, in, into commerce. Um, if you bring those items into a foreign trade zone, uh, you end up not paying the duties on the original components. There's usually a special HTS code for those products for scrap or waste. So if I bring in these lenses uh, and uh, I bring in a box of a thousand lenses and someone runs uh, a forklift over the box and crushes them, those lenses uh, are now uh, waste. And if I were just selling the lenses into U.S. Commerce and paying a 5% duty, I would now be able to enter them uh, at the scrap duty rate of zero and never pay the duties. For companies who uh, are in steel manufacturing and have a lot of, of waste during the production process, two or three percent, it can add up to significant savings um, by using an FTZ. Additionally, uh, China Section 301, Section 232 duties, uh, and I mean countervailing duties products. Uh, that uh, typically have the duty rate locked in are generally eligible for the lesser uh, scrap weight, scrap rate of 0% when they come out. So it's also an option to offer savings even on Section 301, Section 232, and anti-dumping duty and countervailing duty products. But this only applies to scrap and waste. It does not apply to surplus uh, or obsolete goods. So those are the prime, that, that's sort of the nub of what foreign trade zones do. They offer importers the opportunity to defer, lessen, or eliminate duties. But in addition, there are other sort of bells and whistles that have been added to the regulations over the years, in large part by Marshall and his firm, um, that have made uh, operating a foreign trade zone even more beneficial than just the duty benefits. One of them is the weekly entry process. If you're an importer uh, without an FTZ, every time you make entry into the United States, you're paying a customs broker to file your entry and you're paying something called a merchandise processing fee. Typically, those fees are about $950 collectively, $350 on average for customs entry and $600 plus for uh, the merchandise processing fee. Companies who have uh, large amounts of imports every month, and there's, it's, it's not unusual for companies to have 20 or more imports a month, uh, can reduce those costs through something called the weekly entry procedure available only for foreign trade zones. On Sunday night at the beginning of your 
of your work week, you file one large entry estimating all the merchandise you're going to enter over the course of the next week. You enter all that merchandise. At the end of the week, you file your summary adjusting for what you actually entered and you end up paying one broker fee and one merchandise processing fee. We have an example here for a company with 20 imports per month. This would lead to savings of over $180,000 annually. So this is a nice little bonus uh, available in addition to the duty savings available for foreign trade zone operators. Direct delivery admission procedures allow you to uh, uh, have the merchandise delivered directly from a port to your uh, foreign trade zone uh, without having to route it through the local customs port. Um, this process uh, improves uh, your supply line, in some cases, up to four days. It additionally uh, reduces transportation costs. And then we just have sort of uh, on the next slide, just a smattering of different uh, other benefits that are available, uh, typically because of the heightened uh, inventory control procedures that are required. Remember, Customs and Border Protection has allowed you to bring merchandise into the U.S. without declaring it, without paying duties on it, without declaring its value, without reporting its HTS code. They need to keep track of it to make sure that those revenues and reporting uh, are completed properly. So there's a uh, an inventory control and record keeping process that you have to comply with. We found that by implementing that inventory control and record keeping system, ICRS, companies actually <coughs> improve their inventory control, their tracing of inventory, and shrinkage. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, the ICRS requirements, uh, when you uh, establish a foreign trade zone, you'll put a sign on the outside of the building saying this is a federally regulated foreign trade zone. Uh, theft of property uh, is subject to uh, federal crimes such and such and such and such. We've seen companies where uh, that had shrinkage problems, particularly with uh, companies involved in, in consumer products, shrinkage uh, uh, was drastically reduced because um, nefarious employees saw these signs and took notice of it uh, and stopped uh, putting things in their pocket that they shouldn't have. Uh, every time uh, you uh, make an importation by uh, ocean vessel, there's something called a harbor maintenance fee that you have to pay. If you're in a foreign trade zone, you're actually allowed to pay those quarterly. So you'll have some interest savings, uh, which can be significant uh, if you have a large amount of imports. Uh, unlike other programs where merchandise is stored in bond in the United States without making entry, there is no time limit on the storage of material in FTZ. Uh, some companies are regulated by what we call partner government agencies. The Food and Drug Administration is one example. The Food and Drug Administration will often allow companies to bring products into a foreign trade zone that is not uh, authorized by the FDA to be entered into foreign commerce yet and finish the processing of the, pro of the products in the foreign trade zone and then bring it into U.S. commerce. That offers significant advantages for companies uh, working in uh, pharmaceutical and other types of industries. There are streamlined uh, return procedures from overseas. If you want to have a product return from overseas, Customs and Border Protection has a special procedure where you have to prepare a bunch of documentation and track it uh, and show that it was uh, properly exported in the first place. In a foreign trade zone, none of those procedures uh, are required. It's much more streamlined. If you have products subject to quota, it allows companies to bring uh, merchandise subject to quota in the United States, uh, finish it for production and stage it for shipping to their customers as soon as the quota opens. We have clients who have products uh, subject to quotas from Brazil. Uh, after they enter that, after they bring that product in, it takes them two or three months to prepare it for their clients through quota management and their foreign trade zone operations. They can actually bring it into the zone, finalize the product and have it staged and ready for shipment on the day the quota opens. Um, and then lastly, there's something called duty deferral for imported production equipment. If you're a manufacturer uh, of a product and you need to uh, bring in the production equipment from overseas, those component parts are very likely going to have duties on them. And because the equipment is large, the duties can be significant. However, if you're bringing that production equipment into a foreign trade zone, you can bring all those components into the foreign trade zone without paying the duty assemble the production equipment, 
test it, make sure it's ready for operation. And only then at the time that it's ready for use, are you required to pay the duties on those component parts. Again, uh, significantly uh, saving uh, uh, money on duties paid. So that's an overview uh, of the benefits available. I'm sure there'll be questions which we'll be happy to answer uh, at the end of my discussion. But what types of operations are permitted in FTZs and are FTZs uh, in wide use? So virtually any type of operation of an importing business has is uh, eligible uh, to be done within a foreign trade zone. There are a couple areas that the board uh, takes special note of and may put certain requirements on, munitions, for example, uh, alcohol, for example. But by and large, any type of warehousing, distribution, production, or manufacturing operations uh, can be authorized. Um, there's also special operations being done in zones, such as cleaning uh, merchandise, exhibiting it, repairing it, relabeling it, repackaging, testing, uh, and processing. All 50 states in Puerto Rico have foreign trade zones, and they're used by a wide range of industries from petroleum, food products, automotive and advanced fiber materials to chemicals, beverages, <clears throat> fragrances and cosmetics, wooden paper uh, and machinery and equipment. The Foreign Trade Zones <clears throat> Board submits <clears throat> a report to Congress annually and has just submitted its report for the 2022 year, uh, and in it, uh, it identified 197 active foreign trade zone projects, that is projects managed, offered by grantees, such as David's operation at FTZ 119. And there are approximately 1,200 companies operating within FTZs. These, these account for over a half a million jobs. And this uh, 2022 was the first year that annual receipts into foreign trade zones topped $1 trillion. That's a lot of money. If you look at, 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 at World Bank GDP statistics, there are lots of countries that don't have that uh, amount of volume in their GDP. So it's, it's big business uh, for a lot of companies. So we're going to take a minute and talk about the process uh, and timeline for establishing an FTZ, what is involved after you have it up and running, uh, and then I think we'll be done and we'll be open, open the floor up for some questions. So there's sort of three steps involved I like to think of to uh, establish an FTZ. You'll need to work with the grantee, which in this situation is David's group. Uh, you'll need to work with the Foreign Trade Zones Board, uh, which is the agency that, that authorizes a foreign trade zone. And then you'll work with Customs and Border Protection. Customs and Border Protection uh, has oversight authority of a foreign trade zone authorized by the Foreign Trade Zones Board. Working with the grantee is a very simple, straightforward process. There's an operator agreement that has to be executed. It's a very simple document. Uh, uh, an application has to be submitted to the Foreign Trade Zones Board. It is not a complicated agreement. Um, David's foreign trade zone is something called an alternate site framework. Uh, subzone, which means they have done a bunch of pre-work that allows subzones to be designated in a very short 30-day period. We've listed here uh, the various counties that are within Foreign Trade Zone 119 service area. If your business is within that county, you can get subzone designation in about 30 days. David's uh, organization can also sponsor uh, Foreign Trade Zones and subzones outside of its service area but it takes about three to five months for approval. And then on the next page, we talk about the interaction required with Customs and Border Protection. Once you have your operator agreement with the grantee and you've been approved by the Foreign Trade Zones Board uh, to have a subzone, then you work with Customs and Border Protection to activate it for operations. And this uh, requires a little bit of work um, because again, Customs is concerned that you have products on your property that have not been imported products that have not been cleared through customs procedures and they want to make sure they can track it and receive any customs payments that are due that are due on it so this process takes about three to six months it can be longer depending on the circumstances or shorter depending on the circumstances certainly if you're up and running and we've worked with you before but basically you have to prepare and submit an application for activation that requires you to prepare and submit a detailed Foreign Trade Zone Procedures Manual to Customs and Border Protection. You have to have background checks done on three or four key employees in the Foreign Trade Zone, Customs and Border Protection, 
does not want criminals involved in running foreign trade zones that uh, contain merchandise that Customs has not yet approved for clearance into U.S. commerce. Uh, Customs and Border Protection will conduct a security inspection of your facility to ensure that it has um, all of sort of the proper security procedures a normal business would have, gating, uh, cameras, uh, some sort of, of security system uh, uh, signage, uh, checking for visitors, etc. You'll need to secure a foreign trade zone operator bond. Uh, the minimum amount is $50,000 a year. Those cost $1,500 to $2,500 a year annually. They're not particularly expensive. Uh, you would want to, uh, in the application, make a request for any special authorities that you would want, for example, weekly entry or direct delivery, as we talked about. Uh, you have to request those explicitly, but they're typically granted uh, as a matter of course. And then lastly, and this is, this is the real work, you'll have uh, an enterprise resource planning system now in your facility for tracking your inventory. You'll need to either update that system to account for tracing as required by Customs and Border Protection, or what we typically do, see it supplemented with third-party software, where essentially you run your normal ERP system daily, and then there's a daily upfeed to the FTZ system. Uh, Marshall's been working with a consultant for years. He has one that he recommends who's very, very good, who can either uh, put a system together for you and teach you how to run it, or he can manage it for you uh, remotely. Um, so that's what's involved with uh, getting a foreign trade zone up and running. Um, what is involved with, uh, what are the changes that would have to be made to your current operations? There's actually very little changes to current operations uh, that have to be done. Essentially, you'll need to receive, trace, and ship uh, FTZ inventory pursuant to these procedures. Um, uh, and this is primarily done through the uh, uh, FTZ inventory control record keeping system that we just got done speaking about. Uh, the merchandise uh, is received in bond uh, from the port. It's quote unquote admitted into the foreign trade zone. That's primarily an automated process. Then the goods are stored or used in the foreign trade zone. Uh, and uh, their daily uploads to the FTZ ICRS system from your ERP system. And then lastly, they're shipped out of the zone uh, uh, in conjunction with your ERP system with a daily upload to the FTZ IC ICRS system. There's either going to be an entry into U.S. commerce, there will be an export out of the U.S., which would be done by an inbound transportation, and then there are uh, lots of FTZs who work within a network of FTZs, and there's just a transfer to another FTZ. And then lastly, there is some nominal reporting that is required annually. Now, let me say, I understand this is a lot of information. We've got a lot of information packed in here. I'm going through it fairly quickly because we have a large number uh, of, of participants today, and we anticipate uh, some questions but these slides will be available for you. We've taken a lot of time to lay them out in a very organized format. And if you go through them carefully after, I think you'll make it, it will all make sense to you. And of course, David or I or Marshall would be available for any questions you may have. So just to continue the fees involved with establishing an FTZ, there's going to be an application fee uh, with the grantee. There'll be the cost to prepare and execute the operator agreement with the grantee. There will be um, the cost involved to prepare and submit an FTZ board zone application. Uh, we spoke about FTZ 119 service area. There's no FTZ board fees if your application is within that area. If it's without that, if it's outside of that area, there's either a $4,000 or a $6,500 one-time application fee to the Foreign Trade Zones board, depending on whether or not you're manufacturing zero, one, or two items or three or more items. <clears throat> the costs involved to prepare and submit a zone activation application to CBP. CBP does not charge an additional fee. There's the cost involved of preparing your procedures manual, securing an FTZ operator bond, and then development of an FTZ inventory control and record keeping system. <clears throat> As a rule of thumb, uh, some of the colleagues that we work with who've been doing this a long time, they say uh, in your cost benefit analysis, uh, 
you should be able to recover all your costs within one year. Uh, and if you if you can, then you really want to look hard uh, at setting up an FTZ because after that, uh, you're going to be able to save quite a bit of money. What are the fees involved with ongoing FTZ operations? There's going to be an annual or monthly fee to the grantee. I think David's is uh, $1,200 plus or minus, $900 plus or minus. It's not a lot of money relative to uh, the duty savings that should be available. There will be some fees involved for dedicated FTZ management and then um, oversight and use and updating of the FTZ software and inventory system fees. There uh, can be fees for ongoing training any internal audits and process improvements, and then legal and consulting fees along the way. So I think that is the last slide. Uh, we have one more, I guess, that says, how do I know if it makes sense for my company? And simply, you can call David Heyer uh, at the GMA FTZ Commission. He's, he's able to answer questions. And Marshall or I would also be happy to entertain any questions you have about your specific company, uh, the industry you're in, and <clears throat> talk to you briefly about how to do a simple cost benefit analysis to see if it pencils out to uh, to establish a foreign trade zone. So with that, uh, that concludes the substantive portion of this presentation, and we would be happy to uh, entertain uh, any questions that you may have. Yes, and so I have quite a few questions that I've collected from the audience and we are going to stop the recording now um, for the um, questions section of the presentation. So get your pen and paper out uh, for this portion of the presentation um, because I'm sure if your question gets answered, you're going to want the uh, 